This podcast is part of the Dark Myths Collective. Visit darkmyths.org to discover more shows like this one. The darkness awaits. This is a podcast on the Podfix Network. You can check out more shows like it at podfixnetwork.com. There's more mischief, mayhem, and nefarious goings-on in the city of brotherly love than Billy Penn could have ever imagined. We've got it all here on the Twisted Billy Podcast. True crime, haunted history, the coolest and creepiest places to visit. Welcome Welcome to to Twisted Twisted Billy. Hey, Twisters, what up? Welcome back to another episode of Twisted Philly. I'm your host, Dina Marie. First, I would like to give a huge what up to all of you. That's right, each and every one of you listening to this podcast. You are the best listeners anywhere, and I am so grateful for the time you take to listen to the show. You send me messages via email or Facebook. I'm grateful for your tweets and your retweets. I'm also very grateful that you put up with the fucked up release schedule over most of September and October. Between the loss of my pup, Mr. Frodo, and traveling close to every week for work, plus my daughter's birthday, I haven't released an episode on the same day each week for a few weeks. And not one of you has complained, because you're fucking amazing, that's why. Thank you for your patience and your willingness to put up with my completely haphazard schedule. Thank you for always sticking by me. I will always stick by you and do everything I can to bring you the best podcast I know how to create. What ups to our new five-star reviewers, Jen the Mole, DBad44, and Jersey Diva, who shared some amazing ideas for a few episodes crossing the bridge into New Jersey. Maybe I'll spread out a few Jersey episodes in 2018. Today's episode is the next story in the Twisted Prison series, and for this story, we're heading up to Northeast Philadelphia, to a section of the city called Holmesburg, to visit an abandoned prison with the same name. Holmesburg Prison was built long after Eastern State Penitentiary. It opened in 1896 and operated for almost 100 years, until it was shut down in 1995. Today, the only functioning part of Holmesburg Prison is a renovated gymnasium that's most often used when other local prisons are overcrowded. The city considered using this space to house protesters during the Democratic National Convention, but then changed their minds just a day after making the announcement in June 2016. I'm guessing once they considered out-of-towners seeing the state of Holmesburg prison, regardless of whether they'd be in the clean, modern gym holding area, was probably a deterrent. Besides prison overflow, Holmesburg is a favorite place for filmmaking. That gym is used to store camera equipment, lighting and sound equipment, overnight stays for actors and crew. Fallen, one of the movies I talked about in the Twisted Philly Horror episode, was filmed at Holmesburg Prison. Against the Night, a film about a team of Philly ghost hunters, was also filmed in Holmesburg this spring by filmmaker Brian Cavallaro. He's originally from Drexel Hill, Pennsylvania, in Delaware County. The film premiered at the University of Penn in September. Another new horror movie called Death House by Lancaster, Pennsylvania native Harrison Smith was filmed at Holmesburg in 2016. It's a great spot for horror movies. Bigger, more recognizable films like Fallen were also shot at Holmesburg. Scenes from Law Abiding Citizen were shot there, Animal Factory with Willem Dafoe, The Prison Riot in the movie Up Close and Personal with Michelle Pfeiffer, well, all that was filmed in Holmesburg too. Today, the prison sits abandoned and it looks fucking terrifying. Three years ago, the Philadelphia prison system invited a small group of photographers to create a pictorial history of Holmesburg, as it stands today, in a complete and utter state of decay. These photographs are haunting. Imagine cell walls where the paint peeled away so much that the cement is now crumbling and covering the cell floor. Every iron surface, every cell door is covered with rust and corrosion. Many of the walls are covered in green mold where the elements have tried to reclaim the building. 
The glass dome of the guard station inside the prison is frosted from years of neglect. Many of the cells have cathedral arched ceilings and almost everywhere you look, you see a prison that's 100 years old. You see corners where the spirits of men who lost their lives in Holmesburg hide from the harsh daylight that streams in through broken windows and broken walls. Dark corridors hide the horrors that took place at Holmesburg almost 100 years ago, 80 years ago, 50 years ago. Because it wasn't that long ago when Holmesburg made headlines for torture and inhumanity. And that's what I want to share with you today. The history of Holmesburg prison is filled with pain. It's filled with secrets. But eventually what's done in the dark is seen in the light. The first indication something was rotten at Holmesburg Prison was in December 1922, when the Philadelphia Evening Public Ledger did an expose on the treatment of Holmesburg prisoners. On December 2nd, the headline read, Convicts foodless for 24 hours as punishment for even a whisper in prison hell at Holmesburg Prison. The Ledger interviewed former Holmesburg inmate John Westcott, and he said, I saw things that made me, an old-timer, quail. I decided that I would compile enough data to start a fight against this place. They don't boast of the whip, club, and shackles, but they have weapons in the form of isolation and starvation. Both are a thousand times more deadly. They promote stagnation, physical and mental. The list of punishments at Holmesburg went a little something like this. 24 hours without food as punishment for talking. 24 hours without food as punishment for smoking or chewing tobacco. Loss of a prisoner's 20-minute exercise period for laughing. Of the 574 convicts at Holmesburg Prison in 1922, over two-thirds were in solitary confinement. Upon arrival at Holmesburg, inmates' heads were shaved. They were given a cold bath, thrown into a cold cell with no mattress. They had a blanket to cover the springs in the bed frame and another blanket to cover themselves for warmth. Maybe none of this sounds that bad to you. This was a prison, after all, not a Holiday Inn. But think about Eastern State with its 8 by 12 foot cells, open air ventilation, indoor plumbing and heating, work programs, and each cell had its own personal exercise yard. A few days later, on December 6th, the headline of the ledger read Brutal Treatment of Holmesburg Men Known to Judges. Philadelphia County Prison at Holmesburg was notorious for withholding food from inmates, levying punishment for inmates speaking with one another, and unnecessarily subjecting inmates to excessive periods of solitary confinement. There were also instances of inmates denied parole, regardless of their eligibility. In most cases, the inmates' mothers reported these conditions to a man named E.M. Hackney. He was the probations officer for the Quarter Sessions Court of Philadelphia. Hackney reported his findings to the Philadelphia Board of Judges, a group of men responsible for overseeing the prison systems and appointing the board of inspectors who managed the Holmesburg compound. Hackney's office investigated these complaints and in every instance found the complaints to be true. For years, Officer Hackney provided reports to the Board of Judges. In his interview with the Ledger, Mackney made a point to say his reports and investigations weren't judgment. They were merely documentation of what he found and recommendations about what could be done differently in both Holmesburg and Moya Mensing prisons to improve conditions for the inmates. These reports also documented what he called the continuance of complaints, because year after year, Mackney submitted reports to the Board of Judges, and year after year, they did nothing. The reports started in 1917, and by 1921, Mackney implored the Board of Judges, making an argument that the old idea of degrading prisoners was obsolete. Mackney said, Practical students of peniology today acknowledge it's cheaper and better to return a man to society improved and prepared to earn an honest living than to discharge him hardened by brutal treatment. Excessive severity tends to only harden the heart. The strongest and most determined man that ever lived will still succumb under punishment. 
Mackney made arguments about employing prisoners, as Eastern State Penitentiary did. He quoted Pennsylvania legislature, which 18 months earlier approved the sale of materials produced by prisoners and encouraged employment within prisons. But his arguments fell on deaf ears. Less than two weeks after the second article, a grand jury was convened at Philadelphia City Hall. On December 16, 1922, 14 inmates were brought before the grand jury to testify about their experiences at Holmesburg Prison. There were stories of inmates who lost 50 pounds within their first year of incarceration, inmates who were ill and denied medical treatment. Some inmates received medical treatment, but only after giving up their food to the guards. Inmates shared stories of profiteering among the prison officers, men who stole anything they could get their hands on from among the inmates. The Philadelphia Grand Jury ruled that modifications in living conditions, punishment, and disciplinary practices were required, but nothing really changed. If anything, Holmesburg Prison got worse. In August 1938, over 600 inmates went on a hunger strike at Holmesburg. More than half the population prison had enough. They were done eating shitty food, and they were done eating the same food. They were tired of spaghetti and cheese and bologna and hamburgers. I know some of you are probably thinking, these guys are in jail. Are we really supposed to make sure their menu is a bit more to their liking? Remember, Holmesburg had a long history of withholding food, all sorts of vermin in the food and the kitchens, guards keeping food hostage from prisoners. Food was the one area the prisoners felt they may have had a chance to create some change. 23 inmates were considered to be the hunger strike leaders. And the strike started on Friday, August 19, 1938. These men were rounded up and put in the Klondike, a concrete-walled isolation block that was a fair distance from the main prison. On Monday morning, August 21st, four men were dead, victims of what became known as the Bake Oven Murders. The coroner's physician, Dr. Martin Crane, told the Philadelphia Inquirer these four men met their deaths by violence. However, local Philadelphia police investigating the deaths reported there was nothing suspicious. They claimed the four men went stir-crazy. Two pairs of men went nuts. They beat each other senseless until they collapsed and died. That's a pretty specific yet not suspicious manner of death, and for the police to come to that conclusion before the coroner's office had even conducted an autopsy, they must be magic or lying assholes. The four men who died that night in Holmesburg Prison were 46-year-old Frank Comodeco. He was a former boxer who fought under the name Eddie Hayes. Frank was serving 10 to 20 years for assault and armed robbery. 43-year-old John Walters, also known as One Inch Jimmy, who was a transfer inmate from Western State Penitentiary in Pittsburgh. 26-year-old James McQuaid, serving three years for assault on a policeman, and 22-year-old Henry Osborne, serving up to 10 years for burglary and possession of burglary tools. In addition to calling their deaths suspicious, Dr. Crane said the men looked as if they'd been scalded by boiling water. Their nasal passages were burned and congested, consistent with someone who inhaled gas or steam. He suspected someone used high-pressure hoses on these men to drown them, burn them, and beat them. Holmesburg Prison Superintendent William Mills declared it was an impossibility. Either hot water or hoses were used intentionally or accidentally on these four men. He stuck to the story they went mad, split into groups of two, and beat each other to death. Superintendent Mills said around 9.30 p.m. on Sunday night, August 21st, guards checked the prisoners in the isolation block. They found nothing amiss other than prisoners being loud and a little unruly. The guards locked and barred the doors to the Klondike and left. Now, there's 25 feet between the isolation block and the rest of the prison, and an enormous cement wall between them. It was designed to isolate not only the prisoners, but sight and sound. Neither side of the prison would be impacted by one another. The hunger strike lasted over three days. Is that enough time for these four men to have died from exhaustion? A human being can survive about three weeks without food, 
although that timeline is significantly impacted by a person's age, their weight, body mass index, and their hydration. Besides the scalding burns and abrasions on some of the men's skin, one prisoner, 46-year-old Frank Comodeco, was blue. His body was so blue, in fact, the coroner said he appeared to be black. How the fuck does that happen? One of his eyes had been gouged out, which the warden believed occurred during a fit of stir-crazy. The man must have flung himself upon a bolt or something jutting out of the wall. That's what the city of Philadelphia knew as of Tuesday, August 23rd. The strike began Friday, August 19th, 1938. The leaders were put in the Klondike, Holmesburg's isolation block shortly thereafter. And on Monday morning, August 21st, four men were dead by suspicious causes. On Wednesday, August 24th, Philadelphia residents awoke to a very different story. On Sunday night, Holmesburg guards turned on the heat in the Klondike. In August, in a cell block with no ventilation, the few windows they had in the isolation block were closed. Steam heat was pumped through walls filled from end to end with radiators. Yes, the four men who died were the loudest among all the strikers. They beat the bars and tried to make their voices heard throughout the prison. They encouraged their fellow inmates to hold out. They expended what little energy they had left, which didn't help the conditions of their confinement. I've seen pictures inside the Klondike. There's a hallway filled on both sides with radiators. In the winter, the isolation block was frigid, and the radiators needed to be activated days in advance to warm the cells. But in August, during the peak of Philadelphia's humid summers, there was no reason in hell to turn on the steam radiators. The radiators created a fireless oven where four men died because they baked from the inside out. Four other men were found in critical condition, and the other 15, who spent four days in the Klondike, suffered injuries and health issues from being baked alive. So who turned on the heat, and why? A Philadelphia judge ordered a coroner's inquest and a special investigation into the bake oven deaths at Holmesburg. Superintendent Mills gave testimony that he was unaware the heat had been turned on until after the dead prisoners were discovered Monday morning. Sergeant James Hart, one of Warden Mills' subordinates, gave the order Friday night on August 19th to turn on the heat at 9.30 p.m. Mills claimed ignorance. He said he assumed his subordinates ran the prison in accordance with the rules and regulations. If he was guilty of anything, it was of not keeping a tighter rein on his staff. Superintendent Mills claimed Sergeant Hart had no authority to make such a request. Now, Mills may not have known the heat was on, but his deputy warden, Frank Craven, did. On Sunday, August 21st, a prison officer, Captain James McGuire, gave an order around 5.30 p.m. for the heat to be turned off. And although the steam was turned off, the radiator valves were left open, so all the steam that had built up inside them since Friday night continued to fill the isolation block. Holmesburg Prison had rules for the Klondike, the isolation chamber. When it was occupied, a prison physician was supposed to inspect the inmates every 24 hours. That Sunday, prison physician Dr. Enoch was turned away. Coroner Charles Hirsch, who ordered the inquest as part of the special investigation, was completely flabbergasted at everyone's testimony. It all boiled down to a game of not it between Warden Mills, his deputy warden, the sergeant, the guards. At one point, Hirsch basically lost his shit, as we would say today, and exclaimed to the courtroom, This is the most peculiar statement I've ever heard from a large institution that harbors about 1,400 prisoners, and there are no rules and regulations. When we ask a question, who gives these orders, nobody knows. What are the heads of the department for? They're supposed to know what's going on in a prison of this kind. And here, the minute we ask the superintendent of the prison, where are the rules or regulations, he doesn't know. Who is to know? You're placed here for that reason. And if you don't inquire, nobody else will. They could walk away with the prison from the testimony you've given us. We haven't gotten anywhere. There's no restrictions on anybody. The guards, deputy warden, the captain, it seems like they do as they please. I don't know what's the use of having a superintendent of any prison if he isn't capable.
or doesn't know what's going on in his prison. Philadelphia has traditionally hot summers, especially in August. That summer in 1938, temperatures were in the 90s for 10 days in a row before the 23 hunger strike leaders were put in the isolation cell block. The Klondike was already warm, even with the dank cement walls. Once the heat was turned on, the temperatures rose to unbearable heights and literally the room became an oven. As the inquest continued into early September, the city learned heat punishment was a regular occurrence in the isolation block since it opened nine years earlier in 1929. The orders were strip the prisoners, close the windows, close the ventilators, close the doors, and turn on the heat. Captain James McGuire claimed he was given an order by Deputy Warden to use the heat every time he took a prisoner down to the Klondike. Sergeant Hart was questioned as well. He's the officer who gave the order to the prison engineer to turn on the heat on Friday the 19th, and Hart took his orders from Deputy Warden Craven. When Hart was asked if at any time between Friday, August 19th and Monday, August 22nd, if Deputy Warden Craven or Superintendent Mills told Hart or anyone else to turn off the heat, his answer was no. Hart claimed Craven knew at every step over those four days when the heat was turned on, how much steam pressure was used, and what the effect was on the inmates. Hart stated he had no power to order punishments. His only power was following the order of his deputy warden. 1937 was the first time Craven instructed Hart to use heat punishment in the Klondike. It was the first time Hart took a prisoner down to that section of the prison since he'd been promoted to sergeant. Craven told Hart, you turn the heat on, that's part of the punishment. Hart took that to mean you used the heat every time someone was in Klondike. Morris Spatz was in the isolation block that weekend. He was placed in a cell with Comodeco and McQuaid on Saturday, August 20th. Three men wedged in a four-foot by nine-foot cell. Spatz said immediately upon entering the block, he started sweating. And before he reached the cell, he took off his shirt and his shorts. Prisoners were given water with their meals. Besides that, there was a faucet that dripped and they took turns laying under the faucet to catch drips of water in their mouth. How long would you have to lay under a dripping faucet to catch a mouthful of water? Spat said Comodeco yelled Sunday night for assistance, screaming about his asthma, which was documented years earlier by the prison physician. By Monday morning, Spats could wake neither Comodeco nor McQuaid. Joseph Forte was in a cell in the isolation block with the other two men who died. Joseph Walters, and Harry Osborne, although he wasn't brought in until 9 a.m. Sunday morning. Forte said the walls were too hot to touch. You'd burn your skin if you brushed against them. Because it was steam heat, the surfaces in the cell were wet. Forte took off his underwear and used it to sop up condensation from the floor. Then he sucked the water out of his underwear. Osborne was already passed out when Forte joined him and Walters in the 4 by 9 cell a cell that was designed to hold one inmate. Osborne continued to fade in and out of consciousness. During periods of wakefulness, he cried. He cried for his wife. He cried for a doctor. He cried for help. This continued until he was found dead the next morning. Walters passed out for the first time around 8.30 Sunday night. He regained consciousness a few times, but ultimately succumbed to the suffocating heat. He too was found dead the next morning. Over the next two days, the jury in the special investigation heard testimony from more guards, more prisoners, and all the stories were the same. From the guards, they heard, it's not my fault, I was following orders. And from the prisoners, they heard stories of contact burns in the Klondike, despite attempts to get the attention of the guards. On Saturday, September 3rd, 1938, Superintendent William Mills, Deputy Warden Frank Craven, Captain McGuire, Nine guards and two prison physicians were charged with criminal negligence in the deaths at Holmesburg Prison. On September 14th that same year, the case was turned over to the grand jury, who would make the ultimate decision about indictments. Former Holmesburg Superintendent Dr. Frederick Baldy stepped in to replace William Mills. At the close of testimony before the grand jury on Sunday, September 18th, Jury members visited Holmesburg Prison, and part of their tour included a visit to the Klondike Isolation Cell Block. By November 1939, the state of Pennsylvania created a new code of standard prison practices for all county jails. 
after the bake oven deaths at Holmesburg, Pennsylvania conducted a statewide investigation and discovered unsatisfactory conditions at almost every county jail, including fire hazards, lack of sanitation, completely unregulated solitary confinement wings and cells like Klondike at Holmesburg. State welfare officials withheld the conditions of these new prison regulatory codes until after the conclusion of the trial against Superintendent Mills and the other 12 men indicted in the deaths at Holmesburg. Now, I read probably a hundred old publications from Philadelphia, and I found something completely shocking and unexpected. After the trial was set for Deputy Warden beginning on January 4th, 1939, the jurors' names, occupations, and ethnicity, plus their addresses, were listed in the paper. All of that personal information was in the newspaper for anyone to see. There was a housewife, a paint manufacturer, a printer, a junk dealer, and someone called a domestic, which I think we all know means housekeeper or maid. Not surprisingly, this person was also labeled a Negro. You look at crimes like this, prison violence, not between inmates, but violence against inmates by their jailers. And if you took the dates off the event, it isn't totally unbelievable something like this could have happened less than 80 years ago. Then you see the jurors' names in the paper. You see African-American jurors labeled as Negroes. You see their job labeled as a domestic. And you realize as much as that sounds old, like, yep, that must be something from the 30s. That shit is happening today, too. People still talk like that. What are we learning as a society about the mistakes of our past? Nothing, because this morning I went to the bagel shop down the street at about 6.30 in the morning to get a toasted New York bagel for my daughter before she woke up. The news was on in the bagel shop, and the weekend anchor was covering a story about a White Lives Matter rally this weekend in Shelbyville, Tennessee. So no, as a society, some of us haven't learned shit since the 30s or the 60s or even a few months ago in Charlottesville. Six of the 19 survivors of the Holmesburg Bake Oven murders testified in trial against Deputy Warden Craven. His was the first trial to take place. Jurors gasped as they listened to stories about four days spent in a four-by-nine cell with two other people in that cramped space, heat bearing down on them from the ceiling, sometimes hot enough to burn their skin. The men laying one on top of the other because the space wasn't wide enough for three men to lay side by side while they desperately tried not to touch the scorching walls. Deputy Warden Craven actually took the stand in his own defense. He contradicted testimony of the guards and of the inmates. He stated steam was customary because of the dampness in the Klondike. Nothing, he said, made a difference, though, because on the evening of January 12, 1939, former Deputy Warden Frank Craven was found guilty of involuntary manslaughter after just 20 minutes of jury deliberation. His lawyers immediately requested a new trial. Former Holmesburg Captain James McGuire was the second prison official to stand trial. He was found not guilty of involuntary manslaughter on Friday, April 14, 1939. During McGuire's trial, jurors learned that in 1937, McGuire ordered an ill prisoner be taken to Philadelphia General Hospital, for which he was berated by Deputy Warden Craven. Craven told McGuire never to go over his head again or he would be sorry. Inmates tested on McGuire's behalf that he ordered the heat be turned off, although the guards who turned off the steam never turned off the radiators. Superintendent William Mills stood trial just after McGuire in late April 1939. His trial lasted five days and featured a parade of character witnesses, including judges, prominent Philadelphia businessmen, and veterans like Mills, who was a veteran of the Spanish-American War. On Friday night, April 29th, Mills was also found not guilty of involuntary manslaughter. Although witnesses in the coroner's inquest and the August and September grand juries in 1938 testified Mills was indeed aware the heat was on in the Klondike, it wasn't enough to convict him with a jury of his peers once all the evidence had been presented. Mills was guilty of neglect. Now, he wasn't declared that by a jury, but he was guilty of neglect in my opinion. As he said himself during the coroner's inquest, he let his staff run the prison and expected they ran it according to regulation. But there were no regulations about punishment. So for him to say he expected them to follow rules, well, there weren't any. When Hart was promoted to sergeant a few years before the bake oven deaths at Holmesburg, he said he was not told what his new responsibilities were. He just figured it out. And everyone's primary responsibility was to take orders from Deputy Warden 
Frank Craven. There is little information about the other men charged with negligence and involuntary manslaughter. Their names weren't even shared with the public. It's possible the ones who failed to effectively turn off the steam may have received some punishment. Although based on the trials of former Captain McGuire and former Superintendent Mills, my guess is the only person held responsible for those deaths at Holmesburg that hot day in August was former Deputy Craven. Everyone involved was removed from their position and they had to find new employment. For some of them, that was difficult. They couldn't get positions anywhere in the prison system, even after they were acquitted. You'd think after all this, two grand juries, Pennsylvania welfare officials intervening not only at Holmesburg Prison, but all prisons in the state, circumstances would have improved. And you would be wrong. Holmesburg found itself again in the headlines in the 1970s. And we'll cover that in part two of Twisted Holmesburg Prison. I'm not going to say ciao for now because this isn't the end. This is merely the end of part one. In part two, we're going to discuss the events that unfolded at Holmesburg Prison between the 1950s and the 1970s, which are like something out of a science fiction horror film. I hope you'll tune in for the second half of Holmesburg Twisted Prison.